good to see everybody this afternoon. This is a teaching, and uh, our first scripture is going to be on the board in Romans chapter 5, verse 18. And being that everybody can see the board, this board, what I want to show you that um, starting up here, number one, man's, uh, one man's disobedience, we became sinners. And who was that one man? Adam. Very good. Y'all learning. One man's obedience, we became saints. Okay. How many saints do we have in here tonight? All right. How many sinners do we have? None up there, none down here. That's right. Didn't say you couldn't sin now, but you're not a sinner. You are a saint. And if you want to argue with me, argue with God. <laughs> Because that's what he calls us. He calls us saints. So because of Jesus, isn't that amazing? That's powerful. So look at our scriptures up there. Well then, as one man's trespass, one man's false step and falling away led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of... So, all right, con, let me start. Led to con, con, condemnation for all men, comma. So one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and right standing with God and life for all men. Now, boy, that is powerful. Now, you know, I said I'm not going to be ugly, but we have milked that first part up there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Is that not true? How many know that? Do I need to continue to repeat that? So let's labor on what the Lord has done, what the Lord has done. And what has the Lord done? That second part is what we're interested in. Because that first part has been taken care of by Jesus Christ. And we died with Christ. So the old Adam situation there has been taken care of it. Now, here's what you've got to watch out for, and I believe that we all can, uh, we can all identify with this. If you're still, if you are still experiencing condemnation, this is why I am trying to get every saint in this church established in Christ Jesus and not in the old Adam. I mean, we, all, we understand all of that. We have passed from darkness, Adam, into Jesus Christ. Remember last Wednesday night I taught on in Christ? How many is in Christ? Let's see your hands. We're in Christ. And everything we need, we find, and we will find it in Christ. Now, remember I gave the example about me being in the Air Force? How many remember that? And being that I was in the Air Force, all the privileges and the benefits of me being in the Air Force was mine. Okay, that was on the contract. They took care of my hospitalization. They fed me. They put clothes on me. They trained me. They gave me a job. On and on and on I could talk. And that's an illustration. Now that we're in Christ, we have all these benefits being that God has put us in Christ. We're not in Adam we are in Christ now. The Adam situation was taken care of where? At the cross. Okay? So, we need to see that. Okay. Now, our next scripture I want to put up there is uh, John 1, 12 and 13. St. John, chapter 1, 12, and thir oh, 12 first and then 13. Now, but as many as did receive and welcome him, all right, put yourself up there. We have received and welcomed him. And who is him? Jesus. Is that right? Have we done that? All right. We <coughs> have received and welcomed. He gave us authority. See, I got authority. All right. Power, privilege, privilege, and right to become the children of God. Now we are children of God. While when we were in Adam, we were children of the what? Devil. 
Everybody say that. Yeah, you were we were children of the devil. How many believe that? That's in the scriptures. All right. I don't. I only speak the scriptures. I don't have time to look at them all up. We'd be here all night. I wish I did. I locked the door. We get them all up there. All right. So you just have to go home and check it out. If I'm wrong, let me know. Anything I'm wrong on, let me know. But show me in the Bible. <clears throat> all right. So. We have the privilege to become the children of God. We have the privilege to be called saints. With all the privileges that we have now in Christ, we have an inheritance for us kept in heaven. We have uh, everlasting light, life. These things, uh, 1, John, uh, 1 John 5, 13 says, These things have been written that we might know that we have eternal life. Okay? So, to become children of God, that is to those who believe and heave to trust in and rely on his name. Now, let's put verse 13 up there. Now, I want you to get this next verse. This, the, all that's good. And by the way, there's many other verses in the scriptures that verify this out, okay? But I can't put them all up on the board. If I had my way, I'd put them all around here. Who owes their birth? Now, who's who? We. Who do we owe our birth to? I'm not talking about a physical birth. All right. Who do we owe our spiritual birth to? Neither to blood nor to the will of the flesh. In other words, we won't go into that. You, how many understand that? Okay, I won't milk that. That of physical impulse nor to the will of man. Catch it now that of a natural father, but to God. We owe our birth not to mankind, but to God. They, that's us, we are born of God. We are born of God. Now think about that for a moment. <clears throat> There's a doctrine called election. How many has ever studied the doctrine of election? Okay, we got one, two people, a little bit. Okay. I don't want to go into that right now. But every one of us here have been elected to be God's child. We were going our own way, and he chose us. And he birthed us. God birthed us into the kingdom of God. Now, this is how you know you've been born again. You just feel different inside. You know God. You worship God. You love God. There's a big difference inside of you, okay? Because the old Adam, let me back up, the old spirit <clears throat> that was contaminated and died, we were dead in our trespasses. Everybody know that? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 tells us that. We were dead in our trespasses. Our spirit being was dead, and God removed that one and made and recreated in us a new spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Put it on the board, please. Second Corinthians, that's, no, that's, uh, okay, okay, is that the one I want? Second Corinthians 5, 17, yeah. Therefore, if any person is engrafted or nursed, there to get in Christ, <clears throat> the Messiah, he is a new creation. Now, what part of us is a new creation? Spirit. Remember, man is spirit, soul, and body. Our souls are made up of the emotions and the mind, the intellect, and whatever. <laughs> now, you've got to see that that old part of you, that old man, died and was dead 
and was removed, and God recreated. Wow! New creation. Your spirit is a new creation. But you have the same body. It's like a car. Take the old motor out, put the new motor in. Brand new motor. That's what we got in us, a brand new spirit. A new creature altogether. Everybody say, a new creature? Altogether. Spiritual condition, the old spiritual condition, okay. Uh, the old previous moral and spiritual condition of our spirit man has passed away. Crucified with Christ on the cross, buried with him, and passed away. And God has put a brand new, recreated spirit in us. We've got a brand new motor. Okay, you've got to see that now. Behold, the fresh and new has come. Okay? Now, here's basically most of our problems come from the soul, our souls. Remember David said, O soul, why are thy cast down? So you get up in the morning and say, oh, man, what happened last night? Man, that's rough. Your spirit's doing fine. You have your salvation. Your name is written in the last book of life. You're in Christ. You feel horrible. You're not lost because you feel horrible. The devil might be accusing you, but you've got to realize you're in a spirit world, and you've got to fight him off. We have been given authority over him, and he was whipped at Calvary. Remember that. So look at that. Now, <clears throat> I want to go down to this next scripture here. And here's the thing I want you to see. Now that we've been born again by God, and God has become our Father, I want to encourage everybody here, including myself, and I talk to myself, to develop that relationship with your Heavenly Father. I don't know what type of relationship you had with your natural father. I know the type of relationship that I, ha I, ha I had with my father, and it wasn't the greatest, but after he got saved, and that a relationship began to develop between him and me, and it was really, really a blessing. But you, are, you, you have a heavenly father that will never leave you, never forsake you. We have a Savior seated at the right-hand side of our Heavenly Father who intercedes for us, and He is touched with our infirmities. He knows when we're hurting, and He hurts. When we, when we hurt, He hurts. So always remember, God will never leave you nor forsake you. That's what the Bible says. I'm only quoting scriptures. So develop that relationship with your Heavenly Father. Abba Father, in the book of Galatians, Paul says, Abba Father. Remember the other night I was talking about that God has a part in this salvation. Okay? We look at it from our viewpoint. Hallelujah, I'm saved. And that's, boy, that's good. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank God I'm saved. But God has a son now. He has a brand new son, a brand new daughter. Think about that. And he wants to fellowship with you. He wants to bless you. He's not a poor father. He's a rich father. All of the cattle on the thousand hills belong to him and you. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, I'm sure that some of you have, are, just, are, are experiencing that to some degree. If you're, if you're experiencing a closeness to God, a, a, a close fellowship with God, to some degree, raise your hand. All right, that degree can go much, much, much deeper with your Heavenly Father. I mean, where you can be just, you can sit right in His lap. Because the Bible says we can come to the throne of God boldly, with confidence. Not arrogance, with boldness, with confidence to share all of our problems with our Heavenly Father. 
That's powerful. You see, if we're not careful, it's so easy to move into this whole thing can become religious. I'm going to say that again. This whole thing can become religious. Just something we do. We go through acting. You understand what I'm saying? For anybody, I don't care, me, a pastor, anybody, this whole thing, coming to church, walking with God daily, can just become a religious thing. It is so easy for it just to become. But when you have that intimate relationship with God through Christ Jesus our Lord and understand that he intervened in our life and he birthed us. And we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to him. Thank God I belong to God Almighty. He is my heavenly father. Did you hear the story about the rich boy, the little rich boy was talking to the little poor boy. The little poor boy was a Christian and the rich boy wasn't. And the little rich boy was saying to the poor boy, you see that boat out there in that lake? That's my father's. And the poor, poor boy said, you see that lake that your father's boat is floating on? That's my father's. <laughs> and, the, and the rich boy said, you see that big house up there on that big mountain? That's my father's. And the little poor boy said, you see that big mountain that your father's house is on? That's my father's mountain. He could go on with that analogy. All right, so, therefore, of any person, so see yourself as a brand new. See, this is what we call new identification, and we've taught on that, new identification, to break the old pattern of our lives, how we see ourselves for so many years has got to be broken, and we have to see ourselves not poor folk, but rich folk. Blessed folk, our heavenly, God Almighty is our heavenly Father. That's the type of relationship he wants with his creatures. That's why we could call him Abba Father, Abba Father. That's powerful. Okay, he's our heavenly Father. Now, here's what I want you to see. Let's move real down here real quick. Like justification. All right, now all of us here, We've, we've gone through that. We've gone through this. Now, justification, we've been justified. Propitiation. Redemption. Now, all of this we have accomplished, and we'll, we'll come back to that. You don't have to try to do any of that. All that was done for you. I want you to see that now, all the way down. Now, sanctification is done for us, too. There's two sides to uh, sanctification. The side that God has done, and it, is the, and it is what he is doing right now in all of this. What you must understand now, God's not trying to save you. You're not trying to get saved. I'm not trying to get saved. I'm not trying to get justified. You're not trying to get justified. You're already justified. You can't get no more justified than you are right now. All your sins have been taken care of. You've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Your life, your name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You have an inheritance in heaven. God is your heavenly Father. All that's done for us. He birthed us into the kingdom of God. We weren't looking for him. He found us and saved us and birthed us into his family. We are now in the family of God because we're in Christ. And I could go on and on with that. <clears throat> so all of this is settled. Now, the sanctification, we have been, but we are being sanctified. And this is a scripture that we use. I wish I could turn to all of them, but we just, I'll quote it for you. It is God working in us that he might do something through us, okay? So the sanctification is what God is doing in us, changing us now from the inside out. But now our spirit man has already been changed, but our spirit man has to grow and mature and has to learn to walk with the Lord. Our soul has to be, our mind has to be renewed. 
Somebody tell me what scripture do I need to put up on the board for the renewing of our mind. Got you. What's your name? <laughs> Don't try to answer. It's in Romans 12. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I know, Romans 12. <laughs> I remember one time Michelle asked me a question. I couldn't even think of my name. I don't mean to put you all on the spot like that. <laughs> all right, so put it up there. Romans 12. <coughs> Romans 12. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is honest and proper and noble aiming to be a, uh, above reproach in sight of everyone. Now that goes into uh, us learning to walk a sanctified life, okay? But we're not talking about our works. We're not talking about none of that. We're talking about who we are now, what God has done for us. You've got to get that settled first. That's what, we're, that's what I want to get everybody established in. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, Romans 12, verse 1. Willie, sorry about my throat. When you read Romans 12, I encourage you to read 10, 11, 9, 10, and 11, and, then, and you'll understand why Paul is saying to the Gentiles, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God, of all the mercies of God here, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and facilities as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Now, I want to ask you a question. Have you done that? See, that's something for us to do. God ain't going to do that for us. So have you made a precisive decision to present your body as a living sacrifice to God? All right, how many's done it? Raise your hands. All right. All right. Melissa, have you done it? Huh? Okay. Well, we've got to make sure. Let's, let's do it again. Now, don't do it if you don't mean it. So this is a, what is Paul doing now? He's, he's not just writing things down on a piece of paper for us to say, oh, that's wonderful. He's begging us, pleading with us. The Apostle Paul, who's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pinning this down for God's people to see this is something we have to do. The benefits that come from that is tremendous. My body belongs to God Almighty. It doesn't matter if I die. How many understands that? Well, how can I say that? Can you say that? I know some of you got kids to raise. You don't need to die yet. <laughs> but did you know that's how you overcome many things? By surrendering. Just give it up. Now, here's what happens when you commit your body to Christ. He has the responsibility with your help to keep you healthy and strong and to use your body to carry out his plans on this earth. Because after all, we're going to live with him throughout eternity. Do you think we're going to be up there in heaven just doing what we want to do? Have you ever thought about that? Well, I'll go to heaven, I'll just do whatever I want. No, 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 God's got a plan. But it's a beautiful plan. See, if we do what we want to do, we'll disintegrate. <laughs> do you understand that, church? People are disintegrating all around. Because when you remove God from an individual, 
all you have is darkness. If you remove God from a government, there is no wisdom. Because what is the, the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if our leaders don't have no fear of God, they don't have no wisdom to run this nation. If we have no fear of God, now there's a different types of fear. We know that. We're talking about the reverence fear of God, which is a very healthy fear. Because I found my face on the floor like that at times. Boom! As I've walked with God over the years, Lord, I have nothing to say. Thou art God. Thou could do with me as thy see fit, Lord. For thou art God. And your judgments are true. You know God that well. Nothing else bothers you. Am I coming through? You don't try to save yourself anymore. Self is the problem, see? With so, why people have so many problems. So when you give your body and... and, and, and uh, I did, dedicating your body to the Lord, that's, that's, that's powerful. That's part of our reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. All right, everybody say, Lord, Lord I, present I present my body as a living sacrifice to you. My body belongs to you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. I've done that years ago. And every once in a while, I, I redo it. Okay, so now let me, let me go here. Let's look at this glorification. Put Romans 8, uh, 18 up there real quick, like Romans 8, 18. This is where we're moving to now. Now, that hasn't happened yet. We're being sanctified, and we are being changed from glory to glory. How? By the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 on that one, okay? Look at this one. But what of that? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, this present life, are not worth being compared with the glory that is about to be revealed to us and in us and for us and conferred on us. Now let it just burn into your heart. Before we go to that next verse, all the little problems and little things that happen to us down here, it's but a moment of time. Some of it is just imaginary in our minds. The devil plants these little thoughts in your minds and, oh, the end of the world is coming. You're in Christ. What do you got to worry about? See, when you really start believing these things is when you really begin to get strong in God. Over the years, I'm like Paul. I burn inside every time a Christian backslides or falls. That's what Paul said. I, he burnt inside. He just, it just moved him so much. And over the years, I remember this particular time, and I remember many other people too, but I want to bring this one account. This young boy, he's about 16 years old, going to high school, and this young girl, and they were dating. And she just didn't care about him anymore and took up with another boy. And the boy that she had dated for so long, and they were going together for maybe about a year and a half or something, he couldn't take that, and he blew his brains out. <laughs> that bothers me. I'm going to say something, folks. 
I love every one of God's people. Don't ever think that. Don't ever think suicide. Don't ever. We will have disappointments down here, but the Bible makes it very clear. That's why it's so important to study the Bible. No word is in your Bible. Mark it. Let, put a neon sign there. Let it boom, boom, boom. Know your Bible. Know it. Because these things will come right to your mind if something happens. Because you're going to lose things in this old world. I've lost my father, my mother, just lost my dog. Well, none of us like to lose anything, but it's only a speck of time. It's only a little, it's only a little thing. But to blow your brains out, what about your mother? What about your father? What about your granddad and your grandma and the people that love you? I know you lost a job, but that ain't the end of the world. Now, you know that now. You've learned something through that experience. So what? I'll get another job or whatever. whatever. I, I'm going to make it. You're going to make it. We're going to make it. That's why we're in this, uh, in the body of Christ. This church helps people. I can't stand religion. I can't because it kills people. It robs people of the liberty and the, and the joy of walking with God. Religious, it's, it's deadly. The Pharisees, when you read the Bible, you see that religious spirit. They, that was the spirit that crucified Jesus. But God has brought us into liberty to be sons and daughters of his and blessed us with ever spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And our future is glorification. And let me tell you, when we come into our glorification, we're talking about this old body here. Turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. Willie, if you can. Then we'll come back to that next one. For me to live is Christ. Not, well, I'm, that's not the one, but I like that. His life in me. Everybody say, look, look what says, whoop. Well, okay, you're moving fast on me, Willie. <laughs> All right, that's good. All right, who will transform? Who, who will? Who will? How did you get into the kingdom of God? God birthed you into the kingdom of God. Your earthly daddy didn't do it. Your heavenly Father birthed you into his family. He chose you before the foundation of the world. That's what we call the election of God. He chose you. Look at that. Who will transform and fashion anew the body of our humiliation. There's so much humiliation to this body here. This mortal body. He's going to bring us into immortality Look, to conform to and be like the body of his. Who's his? Jesus. Jesus' body. When you read in the scriptures about Jesus when he was resurrected, you're going to have a body just like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're, you're going up. How he do that? Oh, Mary, look at Mary going up. How she do that? She in her glorified body. Not yet, but one day. You'll be able to eat. And not gain weight. I like that. Look at that. To and be like the body of his glory and majesty by exerting that power which enabled him even to subject everything to himself. That power that he has, makes he can, he can subject anything and everything to himself by his, that, that power. That power will transform these mortal bodies. Your body will be in that ground. Of course, you won't be in there. You're going to be in heaven, your spirit. 
And then that body, by his mighty power, that raised Christ from the dead, will quicken that body, and you will come out of that grave. Now, there's a question. Are we going to make a hole through the ground? I hate to mess up the lawn, don't you? But when you think about Jesus, he appeared and disappeared. Remember the disciples were in the room? The door was locked, and all of a sudden Jesus appeared. Outside, he was knocking on the window, trying to get in. <laughs> no. <laughs> he appeared, and there he is inside. How did he get in? That resurrected body could go right through the wall. Eating a submarine. <laughs> Drinking a spot of tea. That's God. This thing is great. This thing is great. All right, look at it again. Who will, who will, God will transform and fashion anew the body of these old bodies out here and conform to be like the body of Jesus Christ. And you want to live down here? For 200 years in these old bodies? I would like to go, how many would like to go right now? Yeah. Willie, two, three. Oh, that's all right. Just hang around and suffer a little longer. <laughs> what did Paul say? To die is what? Gain. Gain. All right. I know where you're at. Because you might as well face it sooner than later <laughs> and save yourself a lot of problems. Yeah, but I want to eat some more chicken before I go. <laughs> Listen, the chicken they're going to have up there is great. Did y'all hear about, the, about the, the farmer that developed this chicken with three legs? How many heard about that? You remember that? You, did you hear that? You didn't hear about that? Yeah. Uh, this farmer and his wife loved chicken. They loved the chicken legs. Of course, two, chick, two, two, two legs on a chicken wasn't enough for them. So he thought, well, he got out of the barn. He developed something, did something, another, ended up developed a chicken. When they hatched out, they had three, three legs. Anyway, this guy is driving down the road doing 50 miles an hour, and this chicken comes zoom by. 75 miles an hour past that guy. Wow, I've never seen that before. He seen the chicken go up to the farmhouse down the road. He go down, went up to the farmhouse. Seen all the chickens out there. Just about a hundred of them out there. Every one of them had three legs. And the farmer come out and says, Yes, son, can I help you? Said, yes, sir. What what are your chickens past me? I was doing 50 miles an hour. He must have been doing 75. How did that happen? He said, Well, my wife and me. Love chicken legs. And two was never enough for her or me. So I developed these chickens, and there you, there you have it. And the guy says, uh, well, how do they taste? And the farmer says, I don't know. I've never been able to catch one. <laughs> All right. All right, let's move to the next one. See, now, we're, we're going somewhere here. All right, you've been born again. Amen. We know how, what, why you had to be born again because of Adam. But Jesus... Uh, came along, and, and, uh, and God gave us the power, and then he justified us. Justification means just as if we have never sinned. Propitiation is redemption. Redemption here, we see that. Sanctification, that's where we're at. But this is where we're heading, right here. And when we get our glorified bodies, it'll be a body just like Jesus Christ. And we will come back on this earth and reign and rule on this earth for 1,000 years with Christ in our glorified bodies. Now, when you read things in the millennium years and even the new earth and all and everything that's going to happen during that period of time, remember, that's not talking about us. Because we in our glorified bodies. And you read all of that, that's, that's about the people that pass over through the tribulation. Jews, there'll be one-third of the Jews that will pass over into the millennium years in these bodies that we have right now. 
and there'll be also um, Gentiles that will pass over into the millennium years, just like you and me, and the world will go on with those type of people on the earth, but we will be in our glorified bodies during that period of time. You got the picture? Don't need to say it again. You got it. How many's got it? All right, I want you to see that. So when you read the Bible, don't put some of that stuff down like we're going to have to endure. We're not going to have to endure any of those type of things, okay? Because we are already secure. We're already in our glorified bodies right here. Now, turn to Romans uh, 8, 19. And time's going by so quick. I'm trying to give you a thing there. <clears throat> For even the whole creation, all nature, waits expectantly and longs earnestly for God's sons. And who is God's sons? That's a, now remember, in the spirit arena, there's neither male nor female. So what does that make us? <laughs> Let me know when you get the answer to that one. How about nooners? <laughs> long earnestly for, what is nature, what are they, what are they expectantly and long earnestly for? I think I'm, I'm leading to something here. For God's sons, and who is God's sons? Us. In Christ, there's neither male nor female in Christ. In the natural world, there's male and females. And why are there male and females? Reproduction, to replenish the earth. Very simple, not complicated. Have you figured that out yet? Got that figured out? Good. Okay. But not so in the resurrection. Be made known. So what is nature waiting for? What is the whole creation expectantly long and earnestly for God's son? Why are they? I'm going to tell you, but think. I'm getting, trying to get you to think. Why? Waiting for the revealing and disclosing of their sonship. <clears throat> and as sons, we will reign and rule with our big brother. And who is our big brother? Jesus. Jesus is our big brother. See, God's plan is bigger than we have thought. We've always looked at it for our benefit. And believe me, it is for our benefit. And God loves to bless his children. I'll guarantee you, all of us fathers love to bless our children. And so do the mothers. So I want you to think about it. Nature itself groaning, waiting, waits expectantly, longs earnestly for God's sons to be made known, waits for the revealing, the disclosing of their sonship. When we come into our glorified body, all nature, because you know what, when we come into that, all nature will be set free from all of the decay and all the storms, and all the hurricanes, and all of the, the uh, tornadoes, and all of the things that nature, uh, those mudslides coming down, none of that happen, will happen again when we come into our sonships and our glorified bodies. Okay? Go to verse 30. In that chapter, in uh, Romans 8.30. We may have to back up. We may close with this. I've only begun, but anyway, I've done my best. Romans 8. <clears throat> uh, man, this is powerful. Well, let's read that while he's got that on the board. And those whom he thus... Foreordained. Who's that? Everybody point to yourself. That's us. Wow. 
Suck it in, church. <laughs> well, and those at the shield of faith, whom he thus foreordained, he also called. Who called you? God Almighty called you. Before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1. So he called you and he also what? Justified you. On the board here, he also justified you. That means just as if you have never sinned. Mary, you have never sinned. Never sinned. You never have sinned. Rick, you have never sinned. Justification. That's what it means. That's what God says. You have never sinned. You've been fully justified. And one day you're going to be glorified. He looks pretty good now, doesn't he, Missy? Well, you wait until he gets his glorified body. How many thinks uh, Rachel's pretty? Yeah, we all think she's pretty. Ain't no, you ain't seen nothing yet. How many thinks I look pretty? <laughs> all right. Whom he thus foreordained before the foundation of the world, he chose every one of us. He chose us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. So what are they supposed to boast about? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, 30, 31. You know what that means? You, you know what that means. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get there if we have time. Let's see. Oh, five minutes, got to quit. All right, <clears throat> so he foreordained us, he also called us, and those he called, he also justified, acquitted, made righteous, put them into right standing with himself. He did it, 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 he did it. Quit trying to do it. He did it already. It's done, it's finished, it's complete. All charges dropped, been born again, new spirit, all Creation is groaning for the manifestations of the Son of God because we'll be in our sonship, in our rule. We'll be ruling and reigning with Christ. Wow. He did it, putting them into right standing with himself, and those whom he justified, he also glorified, Raising them to a heavenly dignity and condition or state of being. Why, they might even think we're aliens. Can you imagine what you're going to look like as a glorified saint? They say Adam and Eve, and I don't know, but when we see the devastation of what sin has done to all of us, what you're looking at here is what sin has done. But if you could have seen me before Adam sinned, you'd be going, Well, I got news for you. The cycle going all the way around. And you read Revelation 21 and 22. Man is now walking with God, seeing him face to face. See, this thing is bigger than just going to church and hallelujahs and, you know, praise God, I can hallelujah with the best of you. And this thing is large, big. Even nature is getting in there. Can't wait. Great expectation. I can't wait to see Mike in his glorified body. Woo! Go! Rah! You won't need your glasses. So break through the enemy's line in your mind and the lies and see yourself what the Lord has done. All right. Go to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 29, 30, and 31. Start with 29, and we'll quit there. Here we go. Are you there? We get, uh, will you have that on the board? Whoo, glory. 
All right. How'd you get there, Willie? <laughs> so that no mortal man should have pretense for glory and boast in the presence of God for what God has done. We have nothing to boast about. Nothing. Verse 30. But it is from him. Who's him? God. For, but, uh, but it is from God that you have your life in Christ Jesus. You're here tonight because of God. You have your life because of God. And we have been created to bring pleasure to him. And he is worthy to be praised. He is worthy for us to give him glory and honor. He chose every one of us to be his children. He did it. He did it. To think that God chose me. He chose each and every one of us. What a powerful thought. The God of all creation. Look what it says there. But it is from him, that is God, that you have your life in Christ Jesus. Remember, he put you in Christ. You, we have our life because of him, whom God made our wisdom from God, revealed to us a knowledge of the divine plan of salvation, previously hidden, manifesting itself as our righteousness, thus making us upright and putting us in right standing with God, and our consecration, making us pure and holy, and our redemption, providing, everybody say, providing, providing. our ransom from eternal penalty for sin. Eternal life is a gift. Eternal life is a gift. And he has given all of us that gift of eternal life. But he's given us the privilege of living with him throughout eternities of eternities, reigning and ruling with him throughout ages to come. The last verse, and we'll quit. So, what can we do? So then... As it is written, what can we do? If we boast, let him who boasts and proudly rejoice and glories and boast and proudly rejoice in the glory and glory in the Lord. Let's give him praise and glory for he's done it all. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So get our minds renewed, and this is what I'm trying to get you to do, to see all this, to get your mind renewed, and, and don't put too much looking at what we see, for the things that we see are what? Temporal. But the things that we do not see are what? Eternal. Wow. Okay, we'll close there. All right, questions. <clears throat> 